So guys, everybody, everybody now know that we are in recording. Um, I like the picture on the background. I don't know if you guys know, Whitney likes to travel a lot. So <laughs> I'm, I'm once every couple of days I'm uh, on Facebook, I watch amazing picture from all over the world and I, I feel a little bit like I'm there. So uh, yeah, this is, this is my real background right now, but I wish I was uh, out climbing in Red Rock country. Uh, yeah, this is outside Las Vegas last October. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. How, how many summits did you climb this year? That's a good question. Uh, you know, since COVID, since, uh, since uh, I've climbed about 50 days in the last year and a half, um, mostly out west. Um, the most, uh, the most epic was the nose of El Cap, which was uh, three nights sleeping on a portal ledge, you know, up on the face. Uh, Alex Honnold did it in four hours and free solo with no ropes. Uh, I did it with a professional guide um, in four days with two ropes plus what they call a chicken rope, which is if, if a guy, if the amateur like me screws up, the chicken rope saves your life. So, uh, so uh, but did uh, just amazing climbing uh, out in Joshua Tree, uh, Mount Whitney, the tallest mountain in the continental US um, uh, in July. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to Ecuador in two months and we're going to climb, same guide, um, uh, there are four of us, um, and we're going to climb three 20,000 plus foot uh, volcanoes, more, more mountaineering uh, than actual climbing. But uh, yeah, it's a good COVID sport. It's incredible. It's really, it's really nice. Uh, I saw the movie, uh, the, the Free Soul, and like all oh, this guy is out of his mind. Very brave, but out of his mind. There is a little bit of uh, yeah, it's actually it's actually pretty safe if you hire a professional guide. No, um, what he did, not what you do, what he did. Oh, what he did. Oh, what yeah. he did is 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 one of the greatest athletic achievements of all time. Um, you know, four hours where one tiny mistake and he plunges to his death for uh, uh, just over four hours. That was crazy. Um, um, I like the fact that people think that I'm doing something similarly dangerous, but I, I, I'm not. It's, it's not without risk, but uh, it's nothing like what he did. Yeah, it was a, a free solo is a movie. It was a, a, a on, I don't know, maybe a year ago. This guy climbed one of the most famous rocks in the United States uh, with no rope. Just yep. chose to climb. Agreed. Nobody did it before. I don't think everybody and nobody did it since. I don't know if any. Yeah, I don't know if anyone will ever do that again, uh, because you know the only reason to risk your life like that uh, is to be the first person to do it. Why would you risk your life to be the second guy to do it? There, there are probably a half dozen climbers in the world that do no, noteworthy free soloing. Al almost all of them die, by the way. There are almost no people who have done free soloing. Um, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of them have died doing other things like base suit jumping. You know, the, the correlation between people who do crazy things like free soloing <laughs> correlates with other crazy activities which tend to kill you as well. <laughs> uh, which, uh, listen, I, I, it's such an achievement, uh, yeah, but I, I offer him that he's, he's going to come down and he's going to uh, satisfied some kind of adrenaline rush that he has that you're gonna say you know what I'll, I'll take it a notch down and uh, yeah and uh, and survive and survive my uh, my uh, my habits I don't know yeah is there much climbing in Israel is are there any good um, good rock faces you know for for climbing is that is that a, is that a thing Israelis do there is no high, high mountains in Israel. The, the yeah. Mount, Hermon, I think, Mount Hermon, I think, is the highest, David. Anybody, anybody climbs here? Yes, the Hermon is the highest, but it's not about the highest. It's about the terrain that is yeah. uh, capable for climbing, interesting yeah. for climbing. It can be very low, but very interesting. Yeah. Like in, so, in one of the, probably the most famous climbing area in the eastern part of the United States is an hour and a half from here in the Gunks um, near uh, Mohonk, the resort up there. And all it is, is it's about a hundred foot wall and it just goes on for miles and miles and miles. Um, you have hundreds and hundreds of routes, but you're not, you know, you're not climbing to the top of some epic peak, but it's a great climbing wall. Yes. Great climber can do it for three meters, five meters, ten meters. 
It's going to be interesting. Any climbers? Uh, climbers, uh, anybody? Alone. Alone is climbing. There is yeah. a new, uh, it's a ninja, ninja, uh, uh, how do you say, the TV show. So uh, they have another uh, place to show the skills. Now there is a TV show uh, <laughs> about it. You have a thing with that as well, no, Tim Whitney? With a ninja, the ninja warrior uh, show? Yeah. Ninja you did, warrior, or you, yes. or you did the, uh, you did the, uh, what it's called? The uh, Spar uh, Spartans, Spartans or something, no? Well, there's, um, there's Spartan and Tough Mudder races, obstacle course races. I'm in the midst of my last three weeks of training. Uh, three weeks from Saturday, I'm doing a 24-hour obstacle course race, uh, world's toughest mudder, um, which um, I am not really in shape for. I'm sort of training like a maniac right now uh, to try and get in shape. Um, um, but I thought you were saying when you were talking about American Ninja Warrior, I don't know if I ever told you, uh, Tal, I've, um, I've applied to be on the television show Survivor, which has always been a dream of mine. And uh, I made the final, I was a finalist a couple years ago and something happened at the end. They didn't pick me two years ago, but uh, I'm back in the mix. I've, I've reapplied. So maybe someday uh, uh, I'll be doing that starving out in Fiji. I, th I thought about you, you know, when I saw once... Um the show and i think after that i read somewhere that you applied to it as well um the echo challenge i saw one the echo challenge oh, yeah. and, and i i swear to god yeah. you came across my mind i said like this is for whitney this is for whitney yeah. to do yeah the eco challenge for those of you who haven't heard of it is um it's on amazon prime i think it's um you know it's a five day race maybe five to five to ten day race it's like 700 miles and it involves hiking um paddling um, climbing, uh, swimming, it's, it's probably 40 different legs, um, and it's teams of four uh, competing, and so I, I watched the show on Amazon uh, a year ago and, and thought it would be fun, so I recruited three of my friends. Um, I thought the way it's, it's sort of competitive to get accepted to do the Eco Challenge, so um, I thought having a team where our average age was 50 or, um, you know, we, they, they look for some, you know, they don't just want every team being super fit young 25 year olds or something. Right. So uh, um, unfortunately COVID hit and they were going to do the next eco challenge down in Argentina. I think Argentina is still closed. So um, I haven't heard back from them, have no idea if we're going to do it, but um, yeah, I sort of, I, I sort of look for adventures, um, you know, when I, when I find them, the, the one my, the one my family is really afraid of is, is after I do Survivor, I want to do the TV show Naked and Afraid. I don't know if you've <laughs> ever heard of it, but literally they put one man and one woman out into the rainforest in Brazil or something, and you're buck naked, and you have no food, no nothing, uh, and you try and survive for 21 days. Um, <laughs> my wife and daughter have so threatened to kill me if I ever go on that show. <laughs> I, I saw this one as well. I didn't thought about you when I saw it, but I saw this one as well. It's, uh, it, should, it should be an adventure. Um, we have a limited time, so we're going to... Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Whitney, we have a lot of Israelis here. Uh, some of them, when I say your name, say, oh, the, the, this guy is, is, is an institution, but uh, uh, many of the uh, people, especially in real estate, not necessarily familiar. Whitney is, a, it's okay if I'm gonna say a well-known investor, stock investor, that, that's good to be good. Yeah, I was, I was in the hedge fund business for uh, 20 years. Yeah, and uh, we read a lot and we discuss a lot and, and uh, about, how to succeed and books about success and uh, uh, good habits and stuff like that. And recently, a few months ago, uh, Whitney uh, published a book, which when I read, uh, uh, read it was, first of all, very interesting because it took a different approach, uh, which is, okay, what happens after my success? How do I keep what I already got? Uh, so that was a, a, for one end, it was a very interesting approach. On the second end, I wrote an email to uh, uh, Whitney just after I finished it. I said, many of the things that I read, I said, oh, I did that, I did that, I did that. Uh, luckily for me, there was no uh, serious consequence, consequences to what I did. Uh, but uh, I went through the list and, uh, and uh, like, oh, I, this happened, this happened, uh, but I got lucky. So I asked uh, uh, 
Whitney to join us and maybe talk a little bit about his book and uh, uh, the conclusion. He knows a lot of people, he had a lot of experience. So talk about it, uh, maybe what happened after, not how we get to it. Maybe we'll get to discuss what's going on right now. But uh, first of all, let's talk about, okay, we got to a certain point. How do we preserve what we got so far and not yeah. light our eyes and open our eyes to the mistake being done after and how we can lose all of it. So Whitney, I'm gonna yeah. uh, quiet down and it's all yours now. And if anybody wants to ask okay. questions, guys, feel free, just bring you back to mute. So we know we're gonna have any noise on the background, please. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tal. By the way, are most of you Israelis based in the U.S., uh, New York area, or are many of you in Israel? I think we have today a combination of all. Satyan is not gotcha. even an Israeli. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. We have all. Uh -huh. We have Europe. We have Israel. It's mainly Israelis, but we have most of them, I guess, from Israel. But we have gotcha. uh, America and Europe all over. Gotcha. Okay. Well, Israel is one of my favorite countries. Um, I, uh, um, I've been twice in 2008 and 2011. Um, the first time was on a central synagogue, um, more of a tourism religion trip. It was my oldest daughter's uh, bat mitzvah that year. And so there were uh, 18, uh, 18 families. Uh, we had 18 adults, 22 kids on a big tour bus going around and seeing all the sites. And then uh, um, I married into the, into the tribe. Uh, I'm not religious myself, but on, I told my wife on our first date, we could raise our kids Jewish and I'm a man of my word. Uh, so, um, uh, I love the love, love Israel. And, uh, we've been members of central synagogue for 25 years or so. I'm, I'm actually, um, it's pretty hilarious. Uh, Whitney, Whitney, the atheist wasp is, uh, I co-chair like the criminal justice reform initiative at central synagogue and so forth. So it's pretty hilarious when I show up at meetings and I say, you know, Whitney Tilson here representing Central Synagogue. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, so, uh, and the second trip, by the way, to Israel in 2011 was uh, called an Israel Innovation Summit. And it was a group of business people. And we went and met with venture capitalists and saw, uh, met, went and uh, met with some of the folks uh, developing drones for the military, learned, uh, got an inside tour of like the Iron Dome, the early stages of the Iron Dome missile defense system. Uh, we visited that electric car company that went under, I'm trying to remember the name of it, you know what I'm talking about. But um, okay. yeah, um, so, uh, so that was super interesting as well. My cousin, who's a uh, Stanford engineer, uh, a medical device guy out in Silicon Valley said, uh, told me when I went to visit, he said, Israel um, is the only place in the world other than Silicon Valley that does innovation right. Um, so uh, uh, very, very impressive. So um, let me just give you a little background on me. Uh, I grew up all over the world. My parents met and married in the Peace Corps in the early 60s. Uh, I spent half my childhood in Tanzania and Nicaragua. Um, settled down in Western Massachusetts for eight years, Boston for eight years, met my wife. I was from New York, and so I spent the second half of my 54 years uh, here in New York City. Um, we have three uh, beautiful daughters, age 25, 22, and 19. Um, and this book um, that Tal mentioned that prompted this call, uh, The Art of Playing Defense, actually grew out of, it's sort of a, a book I wrote uh, for my three daughters, trying to capture my life lessons. Um, uh, um, and, and communicate them to my kids since, um, uh, you know, we get along great, but I actually find I communicate better when I write things down. <laughs> Maybe not the best form of communication, but it works for me. Uh, so um, I started writing this book and, you know, I had a chapter on working hard and having high integrity and becoming a learning machine. And, and then I totally ran out of steam. I was really bored with my own book um, because there have been a thousand books on how to be successful in life. And what I realized is, is that the last part of the book, which is how to avoid the calamities that can wreck your life, was actually the most interesting part of it to me, was the most interesting part of it when I taught it to other groups and all. So I decided to throw out uh, you know, what I'd written pretty much and just write a book on, uh, on, the, on what had originally been planning to be the second half of the book. You know, what are, um, as opposed to thinking about what do I need to do to be successful, um, instead do what Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's right-hand man says, which is invert, always invert. Uh, so in other words, what do I have to avoid to, um, uh, you know, what, kind, what are the calamities that can bring me down? 
Um, so uh, I studied my own life and did a lot of reading and looked at a lot of other people. You op open the newspaper every day and you will see people who have been very successful who've come to ruin. And, and uh, how does that come about? So I boiled it down and these are the main chapters in my book um, of the five, the five calamities. Uh, number one, the loss of reputation or wealth. Number two, uh, loneliness or suffering a permanently impaired relationship with a loved one. Number three, a bad marriage, often ending in divorce. Number four, addiction and abuse. And number five, the death, serious injury or illness of yourself or a loved one. Um, and, you know, I've been, I've been out there teaching and thinking about these, and, and it's pretty hard for me to come up with someone who's whose life is, uh, you know, ha had some serious setback in life, but doesn't fall into one of those five calamities. So, uh, so, you know, I don't know, I could, I could go on and start going through each of them or whatever. Um, you know, the, I can tell you the most interesting chapter to me is the one about a bad marriage, often ending in divorce. Um, you know, originally, um, um, you know, ev everyone almost by definition falls into one or two categories. Um, you're either married or you're not. Um, and if you're not married, you most people are looking to get married at some point uh, in their lives. Uh, and boy, that's the most important decision you're ever going to make. Um, and then those of us who are married, um, I can assure you maintaining a healthy and happy marriage uh, over the course of your life uh, is probably going to be the single biggest thing. The, num the number one thing other than maybe your career and how, how well that goes and how much you like your work um, are, are, uh, is, is one, uh, one of those two things. Um, I don't even know what number three is um, in terms of uh, whether you're going to have a happy life or not. So, um, so in that um, in that chapter, I sort of spend half the chapter on how to how to marry the right person. And I actually have my favorite section is the 12 questions to ask before you marry someone. Um, and then the second half of the chapter is is okay. Once you've made that decision, now you're married. Uh, how do you avoid screwing it up? Because I can't tell you now the number of friends and family members of mine. I'm now 54 years old. You know, we're, uh, I'm, I'm now officially in midlife and, you know, I'd say the first 20 years of my marriage, uh, my wife and I just celebrated our 28th anniversary. Uh, the first 20 years of my marriage, I knew like one or two people who'd gotten divorced, you know, among my peers. And now it's been a tidal wave of, you know, a dozen or two dozen people. Um, and in almost every case, it's just been absolute misery. So I've spent a lot of time talking to those friends and family members, trying to figure out what went wrong. And I'll, I'll just sort of say, I'd say in about a third of the cases, they the mistake was up front. They just married someone who, um, who wasn't a nice person or what have you, right? Um, but in two thirds of the cases, they married well. They had a happy marriage, maybe for five years or more. And then it went bad um, and it didn't happen suddenly. I can't think of a single one of these marriages that broke up where um, it broke up suddenly, where you know the guy went to Las Vegas and was banging hookers or got thrown in jail for insider trading or something like that. Every one of these marriages ended slowly and painfully over five to 10 years. Uh, and so the second chapter, the second half of that chapter is, is, is some thoughts on you know, how, how to become more aware of the health of your marriage. And if you see it starting to, you know, a marriage that was once an eight out of 10, and it's sort of slipped to a six out of 10, you know, how do you get it back to an eight or higher, you know, which is what I'd consider a healthy marriage. So, um, you know, that's a quick, quick overview of the book. Um, I'm also happy to talk about investing and stocks and stuff like that. That's what I do. That's what I've been doing in my professional career for more than 20 years now. I ran a hedge fund for 18 years. Um, and then the last two years, two and a half years, um, I run uh, a very large investment newsletter business. We have almost 100,000 paid subscribers, um, you know, and, and we now have a team of eight people. Um, we have uh, five, six, I think we have six paid newsletters. We're about to launch another one. Um, we have two free, I have a free daily, one of my colleagues has a free daily. And so we're out there giving advice to average Americans. Uh, our audience is not professional investors. It's people out in middle America who are trying to manage their own money. And, you know, uh, we're trying to help them not get sucked into stupidity and bubbles and nonsense and, 
and um, you know how to save and invest properly for the long run. I'm going to stop because I have a question. I have a question, sure. and, and, and I'm going to go back to the book because the book is interesting, man. We'll discuss investment and everything because I have a question about that as well. And it's an opinion. I know it's not black and white. Mm -hmm. Do you see correlation or do you think there is a correlation between success or our success was achieved? And I'm going to go back to the wife and marriage thing and marriage and wife. Do there is any correlation between that and then maybe high achievers versus the simple person? And this is something to take into calculation, especially if you are a very ambitious person, that this is something that there is a yeah. good chance that will happen. Yeah, um, I actually think there's a bell curve at work here, which is um, people who, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, fail, uh, you know, don't achieve any success and get fired from a series of jobs and are, uh, you know, fail to build a career, et cetera, that's going to correlate pretty highly to, uh, you know, in all likelihood, uh, to your, 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 uh, you know, a higher divorce rate for sure. Um, but on the other hand, uh, that, that's sort of obvious, right? Um, uh, on the other hand, um, this is not what's obvious, which is I've seen many marriages end, um, I would argue because um, uh, of extreme success. Um, and look, I'm only talking, we're, we're talking sort of about a high class problem here. We're talking about me and my peers. So we're talking about one percenters, okay? And let me sketch out um, the typical trajectory here, which is um, uh, the couple meets at an elite college or business school or law school or something like that. They both go into the working world and one of them is working at McKinsey and one of them is working at Goldman or something like that, right? And, um, and they're both doing well. But in almost every case, uh, al almost every case uh, I I'm aware of, it's the guy who really, whose career really takes off and they start to uh, make a lot of money. Um, and then the kids come maybe five years in um, and the wife, uh, they don't need the money anymore. They don't need the wife's income. Uh, the wife stops working. Um, and uh, the guy's building an incredible career. And uh, this is someone who's super successful. Um, and, uh, uh, um, and it's led to divorce in a number of cases. And uh, there are a few different factors, um, I think, that, that lead to it. And that, you know, those of us who have achieved success and all uh, should be aware of it. I mean, one is, is to achieve a very high degree of success. I don't know anyone who's become super successful who didn't work a lot of long hours, certainly in their 20s and 30s, right? Um, if not forever. Um, it often involves a lot of travel. So um, you're away from your family a lot, you're away from your spouse a lot, um, you're traveling a lot. Um, so the opportunities for infidelity certainly go up a lot um, and just, you know, moving apart from each other. Um, on the other hand, um, um, also, by the way, achieving extreme success can go to your head. I've seen a lot of guys turn into raging narcissists and become total assholes when they've got $100 million in the bank. Um, and that doesn't correlate super highly with uh, a healthy marriage. Um, uh, on the other hand, and here's something that uh, I've seen a lot, including personally, which is when you take a super high achieving, super highly educated woman and you take her out of the career world and she's, um, you know, taking care of one or two or three kids, um, that works for the first few years, particularly when the kids are young. But at some point, the kids are now going off to school. And you have um, uh, a super talented, capable uh, woman who's sitting at home uh, for six or eight hours a day without the kids to take care of. And is sort of thinking, OK, maybe I'll go back into the working world. Well, good luck with that. Um, she's now five to 10 years out of off the career path. Um, she probably doesn't want to travel. She probably doesn't want to work more than 40 hours. So there go any kind of professional jobs like she used to have five or 10 years earlier. And um, deep dissatisfaction uh, slash depression slash midlife crisis can set in. Um, and so, you know, I'm seeing only guys on this call right here um, 
But um, um, so um, my warning to you is, is, is this partially happened to my wife and I've seen it happen to a lot of women here on the Upper East Side of New York. Um, and uh, guys need to be aware of this um, and, uh, you know, and be supportive of their wives and encourage them to get back into the working world, even if it's part time, whatever. Um, because I've had very close people very close to me, like literally come home from work some one day and their wife said with five kids, five young children. And the wife say to them, we're done. I'm out of here. And and my friend was like, what are you talking about? Like, I didn't even know we had a problem. And she was already checked out. and He didn't even know um, because this said uh, this kind of thing had set in. So um, so. Um, there, that's, the, you know, I call it the curse of success, um, which is if you're fortunate enough to become super successful, um, you know, one is, is make sure that your wife is coming along with you and is happy and so forth. By the way, one other factor is, is one guy attributes his, his marriage falling apart with, when he banked big money, he wanted to spend it. He wanted to move into a super fancy brownstone out in, uh, in Brooklyn or something. He wanted a house in the Hamptons and his wife was just super frugal, was not comfortable um, showing off their wealth and all. And he went ahead and bought the house in the Hamptons and so forth. And he's like, he looks back on it and says, you know, that cost me my marriage. Um, so, uh, so, um, so that's one curse of success. Um, uh, you have to be uh, careful of is, is, is with your, with your uh, marriage. The other curse of success I'll warn you about is professionally, and boy, this one bit me in the ass, which is when you become super successful, everybody wants a bit of your time. Everybody wants you on their board of directors. Um, and then you combine the fact that you've got probably one, two or three kids coming along and getting older and more interesting. And you want to go to their soccer matches and so forth. And every young person in your field wants to just have a cup of coffee with you for a little bit of advice and mentorship. Um, the number of demands on your time from your family, but professionally, philanthropically, et cetera, um, just goes up exponentially. You know, when you're, when you're a nobody in your 20s hustling and trying to become successful, um, you can focus like a laser 80 hours a week on your career and your job. And, and uh, but, but then, you know, if you really hit it and make partner or, you know, make a lot of money or start your own hedge fund or whatever, um, it's so easy to get distracted. Um, and the things that made you successful, a laser like focus on your business and your career. Um, if you lose that focus, well, um, it, you know, uh, the, the stock market will punish you. Uh, the stock market does, will punish you if you take your eyes off the ball. Um, and so in my case, uh, you know, I had 12 years coming out of the box. I had a million dollars under management. 12 years later, I'd beaten the market every year. I was up to 250 million. I was flying high. I was on 60 Minutes. I was on CNBC. Um, and looking back, though, I got horrifically distracted. I was on the board of a dozen nonprofits. I was on CNBC. I was like being this public figure. And I wasn't paying attention to my portfolio, my hedge fund. Um, and sure enough, uh, you know, seven years of miserable, not blowing up, just miserable underperformance uh, ground me down to where I was down to 50 million under management and I couldn't take it anymore and I pulled the plug. Now, fortunately, I found a new career in the investment newsletter business um, that's working out beautifully. So I've ended up on my feet, but uh, I had, you know, I was on track to make retirement money within a couple of years. Uh, you know, you guys understand the economics of a hedge fund where you make 20% of the ups every year. And if you've got 250 million under management, a couple good years and you never have to work again. I was there. I was on the doorstep and I got distracted and this curse of success, uh, you know, nailed me and took me down. That's uh... <laughs> Yes, uh, Satya, do you want to tell us something? No, it's definitely a very good advice. And, you know, I think when I look at all these men on there, you're, you're speaking to the right age group, kind of that where we are in life, right? And you kind of walk that road and given this deep insight and, you know, we, we, we all kind of take marriage for granted and you hit the nail on the head here. Just uh, something my wife and I are going through too. She also, my kids are now uh, 10 and 12 and my wife just went back into the full-time workforce, uh, you know, now coming off those years as you spoke about. So. You put yeah. it uh, very nicely, and it—I'm sure it—it it definitely touched my 
I guess, family career as well. And I'm sure a lot of the audience here uh, have a lot to gain from it as well. Yeah, by the way, you mentioned the ages of your kids, one of the parts in my book. And by the way, Tal, I'll, I'll send you the PDF and you can just send it to the group if you want to read it electronically. If you want to listen to it, it's on Audible. You can just go to Amazon and order it if you want, but I'm happy to give it to you for free. Um, Thank you. Um, um, uh, I can't give you the Audible for free, though. If you like to listen to books, I don't read books anymore. I only listen to them at about 2.8x speed. Um, <laughs> Um, but, We're all in um, the same boat. <laughs> yeah. Um, to your point, uh, uh, Satyan, um, uh, the age of your kids. Um, one of the warning flags uh, uh, that I've noticed is is that when the youngest child reaches about age ten, call it plus or minus, um, is a time when I've seen a lot of marriages break up, and it's because the marriage went south five years earlier. But the, but the parents will stay together, particularly the woman who's sort of looking to get out, maybe. maybe the husband often is oblivious, okay? But the woman doesn't leave because she doesn't want to do that to a young child, right? But by the time the marriage has sort of been crappy now for at least five years, if not 10, the youngest child reaches age 10, they're now sort of old enough. Now, maybe that's 13. I don't know. Yeah, it depends. But my point is, isn't this a very small sample size, but it makes sense, right? I mean, totally. back, back in the day, you know, my grandparents, they, they stopped sleeping in the same bedroom for the last 40 years of their marriage, you know, from age 40 to age 80 or 90 when they passed away. Um, but they didn't get divorced because that isn't just isn't what you did, right? And so, so, you know, we've all seen lots of people stay together for years, uh, even though they're sort of miserable together for the kids. But, you know, if, if, if people are miserable these days, you know, we're, we're now in a new era where some, one side or the other is going to pull the plug, but often they'll wait till the youngest kid is at least, you know, in middle school, you know? So, uh, so not to scare you or anything, but, but <laughs> it's, you know, it's something actually writing this book helped my marriage because it made me think about my own marriage. And I, it's sort of funny, I would come home and I would read excerpts from it and how you know, marriages go bad slowly where the people stop being nice to each other and as considerate as they used to be. And they start treating each other in a way that they would never treat a friend. And why is that? Well, it's because you can get away with it, right? If you treat your friends shitty, they won't be friends for very much longer. You know, they'll, they'll be like, hey, you want to have lunch? Want to get together? They're like, oh, no, I'm busy. You know, sorry, right? They'll ghost you, right? But you can treat your spouse really shitty for years and they're not going to walk, right? So, so it's getting into these bad habits about not being present when you're with your spouse. They, they're trying to make some conversation. You've got your mind on something else or you're looking at your phone. You're leaving your dirty clothes on the floor. You're leaving the toilet seat up. You're hogging the blankets, little things, right? So I would come home and I would read this portion of the book of this chapter to my wife. And she'd, she'd be like, you fucking hypocrite, man. You, you're out there teaching all these people about this stuff. And then you come home and you leave your yeah. stinky clothes on the floor, right? Yeah. And she was right. Yeah. So, so, At least so we're all guilty. We're all yeah, guilty. Just being, just being cognizant um, of the little things with so-called micro interactions. Um, there, there's some research, I think some guy at the University of Washington has done where he just observes people through a video camera, through a one-way mirror and just observes how they interact. And there are a million, there are dozens and dozens of micro interactions that you have with everyone close to you, most importantly, your spouse, every day. And you want to have a ratio of like four or five positive micro interactions for every negative micro interaction, right? And where you have relationships go south is, is that gets reversed, right? So being sensitive to, you know, just the overall health of your marriage on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your marriage today? And how do you think your spouse would rate your marriage today, right? Like that's sort of a big question and you want to be sensitive to that. Uh, but then just being sensitive to the little things, um, um, the little friction, points of friction that um, if, they, if you allow those to continue, um, they, can, they can, you know, you know how a little burr under a saddle can turn into a sore and then can turn into gangrene and the horse dies, right? Well, it's, you know, marriages can be like that too.
Yeah, Dorar, I see your oh, hand yeah. up, go ahead. Uh, so Mr. Tilson, first of all, thank you very much for opening up like that. Uh, uh, I'm on the very uh, side of the bell curve. I've been married for 32 years. I just became a grandfather. Congrats. Uh, thank you. Uh, but you talk about a lot about success and I would love to hear your definition of what is, what, what is it to be successful? What, what's, what's success in your mind? And are we allowed to talk about happiness? Is that a thing? Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, look, Warren Buffett was once asked, um, how do you define success um, at one of the Berkshire Hathaway annual meetings? And he said, if the people who should love you do love you. Um, so, um, do you have a, a loving relationship with your parents, um, your brothers and sisters, your wife, and your children? Um, that, that, those folks would be the first in line, right, in your immediate circle. And then you have friends and aunts and uncles and cousins and nieces and nephews and in-laws and blah, 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 right? Um, but look, I mean, that's, that answer, of course, is an answer we can all take for granted and think about because um, I'm assuming all of us have a roof over our head and food in our belly. Um, in other words, uh, and, and the research out there shows that um, happiness um, um, correlates um, with financial success up to sort of a middle-class existence where your basics are taken care of. Like $60,000 or something. Yeah, which sounds a little low to me, but I live in Manhattan. Um, but whatever, whatever. Um, the the curve definitely starts to level off, and I actually think there may be some downward curve. I mean, I I I know plenty of billionaires in the hedge fund world who have gone either they're miserable today or they have gone through some pretty serious misery. Um, um, uh, uh, di divorce, uh, uh, horrific divorce, um, children will not speak to them. Um, uh, um, and then of course, throw in um, illnesses, um, you, know, uh, you know, now in our fifties or whatever, uh, if it isn't happening to us, it's happening to somebody we know, um, you know, cancer, et cetera. Uh, so uh, on all the money in the world, um, you know, well, can help you get good medical care, but uh, isn't enough sometimes. So. So, um, you know, what is success really rooted in is I would argue sort of two things. One is meaningful relationships and two is, is some sense of purpose in life. Um, um, and some people derive that purpose from their work and they just love their work and love going to work. Um, and uh, maybe you're running a business, you're employing people and whatever. Um, but uh, in, people who aren't in, in the workforce, uh, my wife retired a couple years ago and you know, she and I both were sort of worried that um, you know, she's a real worker bee kind of person, um, that, that that could be problematic, but she's thrown herself into uh, political activism. And, you know, uh, um, and that's, uh, that's been something that she's, she's really involved with and she has a, a group of friends, et cetera. So a purpose and then also, uh, relationships. And it's easy to say, hey, I have 3,000 Facebook friends, you know, look at all the friends I have. But we're in a world now where relationships are a mile wide and an inch deep. And um, in fact, what I think is leads to happiness is, is um, a, a, an inch wide and a mile deep. Um, um, you know, and this is always something I, I've used, you know, uh, the question is, is how many people are there in your life uh, who would hide you? Uh, i.e. The, the people who risked their lives to hide Jews during the Holocaust. Um, uh, you know, the, that's, that has always been a pretty good question if you want to, you know, is, is, okay, that's a relationship that's a mile deep. Uh, would someone risk their life, life to, to save yours? Uh, so how many of those relationships uh, uh, do you have? So I I'm, I'm just want to point out that maybe one thing that uh, just looking at all the faces here, that there's, there could be a lot of uh, cultural differences in the way that we view those issues as success, happiness, friendships, and so on. Um, what's your take on that? Are you asking me or throwing the question out to the group? Just throwing the, the question out there. I, I, yeah. I want to add something, if that's okay. Uh, I, and I know Dror uh, very well. Uh, we had lunch together yesterday. 
Uh, first of all, I think that uh, looking and doing what we do for a living, which is uh, uh, we all do some kind of investing, and this is why we're sitting here. Uh, we tend to correlate success when we say the word success to money. Uh, because this is also uh, 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 the reason behind this Zoom and all of it. Uh, and what I think Whitney is looking now, and maybe it's his perspective because he, he passed that stage and, 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 but on the wider definition of success, and as, as Whitney said, a uh, uh, couple of months ago, I saw it as well that uh, after $60,000, more money doesn't make you more happy. And there was another study that was published recently that shows that what affect uh, people, uh, 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 how long they live was not money or not success on that, is how many strange people they're speaking with on a regular basis. You mean uh, meeting new people, making new relationships? No, no, not necessarily. Actually speaking to, 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 to strangers. So if you're talking to the mailman and you're talking to the garbage guys and you're talking to people on the street or you're sitting in that, right. that is a thing that affect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, look, um, if you guys, um, if you ever walk the streets of Italy, particularly the smaller towns of Italy, and you, or I was just got back from Greece and Spain. I was just two weeks in Greece and Spain in the last two weeks. Um, and you go through the small town and you see the elderly folks sitting out on a chair just out along the sidewalk. And, um, you know, maybe they may even be, they, they, they're going to outlive us all, even though they're all smoking and drinking, right? Because there's this uh, community and, uh, um, and they're just interacting with people and seeing, you know, because, because the one thing that's just deadly is, you know, what we do in the US too much is, is we stick people in nursing homes or something, and they're isolated, um, and, um, you know, uh, one of the calamities that I talk about is loneliness. There is an epidemic of loneliness uh, in this country um, and around the world. Um, and you would think with Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and all, you would think that that would be connecting people and the loneliness would be going down. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Um, um, people are retreating onto their phones. Um, and, and so that has two factors. One, they're not talking to each other on the phone. Two, they're not seeing each other in person. And three, your life looks like shit compared to the perfect lives that you see of everybody on Instagram, for example, um, which is, of course, a fake and phony picture that everybody else is painting, right? But um, so, uh, so very alarmingly, um, uh, particularly when you've got young daughters like I do, um, eating disorders, depression, anxiety, um, for those of you, I'm, I'm looking at your pictures here, I'll bet a bunch of you've got teenagers, uh, particularly teenage girls, which is what I have more experience with, um, being super, super attuned uh, to this risk. The single biggest risk for your daughter um, is an eating disorder. Um, and uh, you've seen the recent scandals just in the past week or two about how Facebook knows that, you know, one out of every eight users of Instagram, um, Instagram is fueling that eating disorder, right? Uh, so by the way, that's not true. I would not argue that's true of the entire US population or world population, but particularly among one percenters, wealthy, wealthy teenage girls um, is, is the biggest risk factor. I can't tell you how many, how many of your, uh, of my friends uh, have daughters with eating disorders and it is uh, absolutely hor horrific. Uh, thank you, uh, Whitney. I wanna ask another question. Uh, somebody here bothering me on uh, there, but uh, yeah. try to ignore it. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why I'm asking it because it's I'm going to give an example. But uh, uh, on Friday, uh, and of course it's an extreme. On Friday, a very famous real estate investor or, or the, uh, uh, entrepreneur entrepreneur in uh, Israel was murdered after he had some. Uh, 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 his business went south over stuff that he did. Of uh, obviously, he did some stuff that he wasn't. Uh, it went to court and and. Uh, and somebody decided to end his life uh, on Friday. 
which bring us to the reputation question. And uh, in our business, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you hear a lot about all the guys that uh, went south versus uh, uh, the one that doing good job. But things happen and uh, either, either it's, it's a behavior or even uh, an honest business mistake, sometimes reputation goes bad. And I wanted to, do, to, to hear your opinion about the way to rebuild it versus if it went south, is it possible? And if it's possible, do you have any advice to somebody that got to that point, what yeah. happens next? What do I do yeah. next after this happened? How do I recover from something like this? Yeah, it's a good question because look, the, the primary focus of my book is, is if you've achieved some uh, a level of success, how not to lose it. Um, but look, the reality is, is I don't know, a single person has gone through life without some major setback, right? Uh, professionally, personally, you know, health wise, uh, you know, whatever, um, you know, and uh, um, and. I, I don't spend a big chunk of the book talking about it, but I, I do a little bit, which is, um, is, is, you know, how do you get, how do you get through a very, very difficult period? Well, hopefully you, first of all, have um, um, a spouse and family and friends who are there to support you and pick you up. And that's something you can't create once you're in the shitter you hopefully have built that over a lifetime of being there for other people and building those relationships, right? Um, so even if, you're, even if you're flying high right now um, and don't think you're ever gonna need it, you will someday, it's almost certain, um, and build those relationships and invest in other people and help, help other people out when they're going through a tough period. Um, not only because it's the right thing to do and, uh, uh, and all, but, um, um, uh, but, but they'll be there for you. And by the way, <laughs> one of the ways I've written this book is, is by being there for my friends when they've gone through divorces, uh, you know, when they've suffered calamities is, is I've learned, like, in other words, uh, you know, I'd much rather learn how to avoid calamities by not experiencing them myself, but by observing other people experiencing them and learning, you know, how, how it could have been avoided. Because sometimes, you know, I would argue, I would argue that 80% of the calamities, all the calamities I've ever seen, 80% of them were avoidable. 20% are just sort of bad luck. You know, someone who's never smoked a cigarette in his life gets lung cancer or something like that, right? I mean, there's, some of it is, but the vast majority, if you just open the newspaper and look at people who are who have bef uh, calamities have befallen them, uh, in most cases, uh, it's because they did something stupid and paid the price for it, right? So, uh, so uh, to, your, uh, to your question, um, what do you do uh, when you're in the toilet, uh, bad things have happened, and you've got people around you supporting you is, is there's a, so there's a technique that the Navy SEALs use, um, which is uh, when, you're, when you're going through something very difficult, they call it your three foot window. And the idea is, is if you're rock climbing or something, and I apply this when I'm rock climbing, which is don't look up, don't look down. You, the only thing you can control at that moment is what's right in front of you in about a three foot square, right? Your three foot window. Um, and, you know, it, it sort of gets back to the cliche, you know, how, how do you, you know, how do you, uh, what's the journey of a thousand miles? Uh, well, it begins with the first step, right? So it can be when you're going through something terrible, a health crisis, a uh, divorce, uh, getting laid off from your job and needing to find another job, maybe your business has failed, whatever. Um, it, it can be overwhelming and the, and the sheer magnitude of what's happening to you can paralyze you. And generally that's not what you want, right? So um, there are two general things is, is one is, is you know, reach out for support. Uh, when I was going through a tough period in my life, uh, seven, eight years ago, um, both my, I was closing down my hedge fund business. I was dealing with a crisis in my extended family. Uh, I went and saw a shrink. I paid 500 bucks for every 45 minutes to go talk to a very high end shrink here in New York City. You know, I'd never seen a shrink before in my life. Maybe I thought it was a sign of weakness. I didn't need it, you know, whatever. But you know what? So enough friends of mine said, Whitney, you know, go talk to a professional. You're not the first person whose business is blown up, who's dealt with this kind of family crisis. 
a, a, a highly trained professional has probably seen what you're going through dozens of times and might help you think about ways to get through it, et cetera, right? So seeking professional advice, reaching out for support from friends, trusted friends and family um, and, and listening to them. Because one of the things you have to understand is, is when you're going through a crisis, you're probably not doing the best thinking on your own. Um, so having other people um, who know you well and or who are professionals, um, you know, add their thinking uh, is really important. And then um, focus just one day at a time, okay? Like my friends going through a divorce, one of my friends um, I thought had a very healthy attitude. He's a billionaire guy whose name you've probably all heard of. Um, but he said, you know what? There are a million people who get divorced every year in the United States. Uh, you know, mine is more because there's so much money at stake is gonna be harder than usual, but it's a process. And it's gonna take at least six months. It might take 12 months. It might take 18 months. I really can't control it. It's a question of whether uh, how psycho my ex-wife is gonna be. Um, but that I can, uh, I can try and behave well, but I can't predict how she's gonna behave. And if she lawyers up and drags this out, it could go on for a while. But he said, it's largely out of my control. I'm gonna behave the best I can, but it's just a process and there's no way to speed it up. So Warren Buffett once said, you can't have a baby in a month by getting nine women pregnant, right? Sort of funny, but it's sort of wise, right? There are certain things that just take time. Um, and so you just got to approach it one day at a time and try and put one to make one step forward every day. Um, and after a lot of days, you'll find you made a lot of progress. It's a good advice. Take it one what, what, what day at a time. Uh... A uh, question, guys, anybody? No. Uh, I know you're short of time, uh, but I, I'm sure there is people that you would like to uh, uh, hear your, uh, we're going to step away from the book for a second. And, uh, and again, I know that you, you're short on time. Uh, your opinion, your view of where we are right now. We are very strange. Uh, I'm writing my quarterly report to my investors and I wrote them down that uh, this is unprecedented. Uh, the situation that we are right now is uh, nothing that uh, nobody ever encountered before. It's, it's so, so strange that uh, they so we'll be interested uh, to hear what you think where we are right now in the market. I don't think anybody really knows where we're going for here. It's gonna be going up or down, but uh, still I'm sure you have an opinion and I will happy to hear it. Yeah. Well, look, the mistake, um, the mistake I made that really ended up costing me my business was after 2008, um, I survived the downturn pretty well. I anticipated that things were going to get bad. I positioned my portfolio more defensively. And so I was sort of down half what the market was in 08, for example, um, and then played a strong hand uh, coming out of the bottom and was really flying high. Um, what eventually put me out of business over the next seven years is, is that I then, um, I didn't ride that bull market. Um, and I kept seeing another 2008 around the corner and getting super defensive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and look, the reality is, is uh, you know, right now, except for a three week hiccup um, a year and a half ago, we're at least in the US, um, you know, in a 12 year bull market. Um, and smart investors know to ride. You, when you're in a bull market, keep riding it. Um, and that doesn't mean go out and buy Dogecoin or, you know, really ramp up the risk. Um, but it does mean, you know, don't try and get too cute. Don't try and anticipate uh, the next storm. Uh, you know, here, here I was for years on end, the skies were blue, uh, you know, and I had my ship, my hedge fund sailing along. And I had my sails trimmed and, you know, was preparing for a storm, even though the skies were blue, right? Um, and I kept seeing far off in the distance, some dark and stormy clouds and getting super defensive. And here's the reality is, is if you go back, markets, I mean, what happened a year and a half ago um, was unprecedented where you had a 35% decline in the S&P 500 in no matter what, three weeks, right? Um, if you go back to the collapse of the internet bubble, the housing bubble, they happen slowly. You didn't have to be a genius in predicting uh, that things were getting bad. Um, you had six months or a year um, to, to start getting defensive, right? So 
Um, look, my general view is, is you know, the e economies around the world are on fire. Um, the Fed and the equivalents around the world continue to pour money into the economy with monetary stimulus. Um, massive fiscal stimulus is occurring. Um, and by the way, if you, um, the, the latest, uh, the infrastructure bill, I think, is very likely to pass here in the U.S. I think the Build Back Better, um, you know, social bill, which would dump another um, you know, Biden's talking about three and a half trillion. The betting sites have it at about two trillion, but that's still two trillion dollars over the next couple of years, uh, 10 years, excuse me. Um, there's so fiscal stimulus I don't see going away anytime soon. Um, interest rates are still very low. So look, there are plenty of things to worry about. Uh, you know, inflation, the year over year comps for businesses are going to start getting tough, et cetera. But my, you know, our suggestion is uh, the way what we're how we're positioning our newsletters and all is is, look, the bottom line is is we're in a bull market. All the things that have fueled this bull market are still intact, and so until that changes, you know, I, I can see bits of foolishness that remind me of 1999, but they remind me of early 99 not late 99, early 2000. And keep in mind, the NASDAQ went up 85% over the, that 12-month period from March of 99 to March of 2000. Uh, so, uh, um, so our general view is, is reasonably constructive. And we're just out there just doing bottoms up stock picking. Um, and um, and you know, we're, we're finding things to do. I, I don't think it's a great environment. I mean, we were really pounding the table on March 23rd of last year. Uh, we, we did a two hour video for all our subscribers. Um, literally the hour the market bottomed is when we were taping it. We aired it the next day um, saying, this is the best time to buy stocks since the global financial crisis. Clearly that is no longer the case with the um, S&P 500 uh, roughly doubling since then, almost doubling. Um, but, uh, um, but, you know, these bull markets have incredible momentum behind them. And, you know, I paid a big, big price. It really cost me my business by trying to get too cute in picking the top or predicting that things were about to decline. Um, and the reality is you don't have to be that smart. Just keep writing it until, until the writing is really on the wall. How do you feel? And I heard the, uh, what's her name, uh, the lady, uh, the interviewer that she anticipated the inflation of 2% for 2021 and we are approaching what, five now? Yeah. Uh, how that going to affect? I know from real estate perspective, we are happy because with the inflation, the value of our properties goes up. Uh, right. So we, yeah, so we're happy with it. But in general, do you think the the it's still some kind of a tax for most of the people? Is that going to hurt the market? In yeah, the, I mean, the anytime soon. Is, yeah, the raging debate, of course, is 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 this inflation um, sort of a temporary thing coming out of? you know, last year's where everything was so depressed, you're sort of having a springback effect. And is it is it temporary or or not? Um, I don't claim to be an expert on this. Um, I'm not trained as an economist. Um, and the, uh, so so um, my guess is the consensus view out there and you can you can see the consensus view and where bond prices are and where treasuries are, for example, is, is that this is a, likely to be a short-term phenomenon. That's what's being priced into the market. Um, if you have a very, if you are absolutely convinced uh, that we're about to go into a, a, you know, a period of sustained high inflation, um, I'm sure there are ways to play it, but, um, but I don't think that's likely. Um, uh, so, you know, again, I, my expertise is, is analyzing companies and finding reasonably priced stocks, you know, relative to the future prospects of a company. Um, and only during times of market extremes, either bubble tops or bear market bottoms, do I tend to form a macro opinion. And I've been pretty good at that over the years. You know, I, I nailed basically both the top and the bottom of the internet bubble, the housing bubble, I did not nail the top of the COVID bubble. I did not anticipate that things would get so bad so quickly, but I absolutely nailed the bottom, right? Um, so, uh, but look, that happens once every five to 10 years. And most of the rest of the time, I just, uh, uh, my, the lesson that I've learned over more than 20 years is, is 
uh, not not to try and be too smart and get too cute and just focus on you know doing what I do. You guys are out there just doing real estate and I'm out there picking stocks. Um, I just want to barge in um, if it's okay. How do you feel about technology? Uh, more specifically about Arc and uh, Katrina Woods? Because yeah. I have a feeling I bought in the wrong time. Yeah, I'm not a fan. Um, if, you, if you go to Empire Financial Research, uh, which is my website, uh, slash archive, you can just do a search, um, just search for the word Kathy, C-A-T-H-I-E, and it'll pull up stuff I've written. Um, I've seen her type before. Um, and, you know, there was Mary Meeker back in the internet days and, you know, whatever. Um, you know, they're sort of bull market geniuses. Um, um, she may be right that this, uh, you know, this tech bubble has room to, to inflate further. Um, but um, I think uh, my observation is, is um, there, there are a number of things that really worry me about her specifically. One is, is um, the interviews I've seen of her and so forth is there's no humility at all. There's no acknowledgement. Yeah, we're paying a high price. Um, you know, here's what could go wrong. Um, so she's a zealot. Um, and you contrast that with Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, who are always saying, you know, we could be wrong. And, um, and you know, they're very confident, but very humble. People who only have the confidence side of that equation um, uh, are very dangerous as, as investors. Um, number two is, is she publishes um, everything, all her stock moves every day. Um, and when you combine that with a third risk factor, which is she's a very large shareholder now in a lot of illiquid stocks. So she, when she was very small and she just owned a bigger, some bigger cap thing like Tesla, that wasn't an issue. But now she, um, as all the money has come pouring in, she's been investing in um, smaller companies with a much bigger pool of capital. And therefore she's moving the market to some extent her own buying is fueling the stock's rise, which then enhances her performance, which then draws more money in, which then she then invests, which drives the stocks higher, lather, rinse, repeat. But boy, when that unwinds, that can be really ugly, really fast, number one. And number two is, is because you're publishing when it does unwind and she has to start selling and everybody else in the world can see exactly what she's selling every day because she's disclosing it daily. Um, that, that, that is, um, you know, those factors that I've just outlined are a recipe for disaster. Uh, so look, if you want exposure to, um, uh, you know, high tech and growth and whatever, um, you know, we have a newsletter called, one of my colleague writes called Empire Elite Growth, and he owns things like Shopify and Square and things trading at 10 times revenue or more, the kinds of things I, I would never have bought in, in my own uh, fund because I'm just more, I'm more price sensitive. But you know what? I, I do think there's room in your portfolio for some growth stocks, but I just wouldn't, and I wouldn't look for exposure to it through Kathy Wood and ARC because of those specific risk factors that I see there. Okay, thank you. Anybody? If you guys feel uncomfortable asking in English, you can write it down and I can tra translate because I know sometimes the English become an issue. So if somebody have any question for, for Whitney and you'd like to, to just to type it and I'll read it for you, feel free. Uh, I know that you are not a real estate guy, Whitney. We had this conversation before. I do want to ask you about, and this is more for real estate guys, to stocks, where this is the balance between I mix my investment. I'm I'm a totally a, a, a real estate guy. Ninety nine point nine percent is is real estate, and I don't think it's 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 smart, but this is what I know. So I do I, I default to what I know best. But diversity wise. Where, how do you see it as a versity wise versus stocks versus real estate with the other uh, instrument of investing? Yeah. Um, well, look, um, I'll answer it in a couple of ways. Um, one is, is you need to distinguish between get rich investing and stay rich investing. 
Um, and so it depends where you are on the spectrum. Um, um, again, I don't know. I bought, I've purchased one piece of real estate in my entire life. It's the apartment I'm sitting in right now. And I bought it 18 years ago and that's it. So, so I, I don't know much about real estate. Um, uh, I do know that you guys love to use a lot of debt. Uh, a lot of leverage sort of makes the numbers work. Um, and um, debt is risky. Um, and so the real estate sector really goes through boom and bust because of such high use of debt. Um, and look, if you are practicing get rich investing, um, then, you know, whatever the banks will lend you, lever it up and, you know, hope, the, hope, hope you get out before the bus comes, right? Um, but, um, but just understand the risk you're taking. Um, and, you know, Charlie Munger once said, um, if you run through a dynamite factory with an open torch and you happen to get to the other side without blowing yourself sky high, it doesn't mean it was a good idea. Um, so in this 12 year bull market, we've experienced, um, uh, you know, a lot of people have run through a lot of dynamite factories with open torches and they made it through to the other side because we're in a bull market. Um, and, you know, another, another phrase, similar phrase, you know, Warren Buffett says, you never know swimming naked till the tide pull, uh, goes out. Right. Um, a lot of people swimming naked and they don't know it and nobody else knows it. Right. So, um, so the, the, what I would suggest though is, is if you've been really successful and you're sitting on a real nice nest egg, like there's a guy who I just spent the night with a couple of weeks ago when I was going through Seattle. Um, one of my readers, barely, I'd met him once before in my life, but he offered to put me up at his house. He showed me his portfolio and his stock portfolio since 2008, I think he started with $2 million. It went down to 500 grand and now it's over a hundred million dollars. Um, just buying a lot of small cap stocks, but he's been using a bunch of leverage and takes very big positions and all. And it's worked. Um, he's ridden this bull market to the max, but he's still got $30 million of debt. Um, so he's got $130 million stock portfolio with $100 million of equity. Now that's not dangerous over leverage, but he's also, he showed me his actual portfolio and he's got a bunch of 15% positions, like $15 million positions in some pretty illiquid small cap stocks. And I was like, dude, the first thing you should do is um, sell enough stocks such that you don't have $1 of debt because you've already made it. You never have to work again. You've got a hundred million of equity right now. You just bought a beautiful house for $5 million on Lake Washington. Um, he works from home and he, he's done, he's done. Um, he, um, and so I said, you know, his mindset is he's a get rich investor. And that's all he knows. And so I, I'd like to think maybe I was helpful to him. And I said, put, put, you know, first of all, get rid of all your debt. Number two is, is put $20 million in short-term treasuries, the world's safest investment. So if the world completely goes to hell, you've still got $20 million uh, there. Um, and then I would just dial back the risk some. I mean, keep investing in the stocks you know how to do, but don't put $15 million into one stock, uh, some Canadian not quite penny stock, but small cap stock, right? So all I would say is, is apply that. Uh, if I were to look at your real estate portfolios and those of you bank some, some real money and all, um, you know, think about, do I really need in, in, a, in a world where, they, where the banks will give you the rope to hang yourself for sure. They'll, they'll lend you enough debt to get you into real trouble if there's a downturn. Um, and, um, um, and think, you know, maybe, maybe you, you're at a stage in your career where you need to take some risks. Uh, um, uh, but if you're not, um, you know, making that transition to practicing, get ri uh, stay rich investing, uh, for the rest of your life, uh, dialing back the leverage, uh, keeping some very liquid assets. Like right now, my overall portfolio is I'm one third cash. Um, one third S and P 500 index fund and one third, um, a dozen stocks that I've purchased. Okay. So I'm two thirds in the stock market, U S stock market, which is what I know, but I'm not trying to be too fancy. Uh, even though my business for 20 years was picking stocks, I have half my stock portfolio, just in an index fund. Um, because it's not a super attractive time out there, but what am I supposed to do? Uh, I don't need more than uh, a third of my assets in cash. So I got lots of dry powder. Now, by the way, in March of last year, 
I was 10%. I, 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 when I closed my hedge fund, I had to sell all my stocks. This was in 2017. And I, had, uh, I took a distribution of cash, just like all of my investors, okay? So I was like 80% cash in my personal portfolio. Um, and I didn't love the market and I wasn't finding great stocks. So I just sort of left it in 80% cash. I didn't really care. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't feel like it was a time to, to be getting greedy, whatever. And then lo and behold, it took more than two years, but COVID hit and the market puked out. And in a matter of one week, I went from 80% cash to 85, 90% invested. Um, not, eh, maybe it took, it took place over two or three weeks. Like when the market was down 20%, I put 20% of my cash to work. It went down 25%, put another 25. I just bought all the way down. Um, so I didn't exactly nail the bottom, but by the time the market bottomed down 35% in three weeks, um, I was probably 80, 85% cash. And then the market rallied in a matter of months, stock market was up 50%, and I sold a little bit, right? And so I sold a little bit more today, I'm back to about 33% cash, right? So I'm, I'm, look, I'm not, I don't have retirement money, uh, but I've got a good income uh, from, my, uh, from my investment newsletter business. So I am going to be a net saver um, for at least the next 20 years uh, of my life. I'm going to have income that exceeds my expenses um, with a high degree of confidence for the next 20 years. Um, and therefore, um, e therefore, I could, it wouldn't be unreasonable to have all of my long-term money in stocks. But you know what? I like having dry powder sitting around um, and every three to five years, a big puke out comes and I can put that money to work. I think Charlie Munger said, uh, you know what, have 10 million in your checking account and you know, which was the deal to start by, right? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I'm actually writing about it. Um, if you guys go look at Empire Financial Research uh, on Friday, today and tomorrow, I'm writing about a little energy company called Sandridge Energy, where I made, you know, I bought it. Uh, the stock went from 25 to a buck. I bought it at two bucks last April. Um, and, you know, today the stock's at 12 or something. And I just sold 80% of my position. And it was just a bet that natural gas and oil prices would rebound, manifested and uh, through this. But I don't know, it was a $50,000 position that went to $300,000. And I banked most of those profits this week just because oil hit a 14 year high. Um, and you know, I, I, my investment thesis was clear going in that we would figure out the pandemic, that demand for oil and natural gas would rebound both commodities. Sandridge Energy has exposure to both. Um, that, uh, um, and then I, I practiced sit on my ass investing. Uh, and so I didn't even look at it. I didn't look at the company's quarterly earnings reports because I wasn't making a bet on the company. It was just a way to play the, com uh, the commodity, which was a way to play the world economy and a recovery from the pandemic. And uh, so I bought at a 25 year low um, in terms of oil and natural gas prices. And I'm selling at a 15 year high, you know, and, and I didn't do anything in between. I didn't trade around the position. I basically, I forgot about it. Um, and you know, what's interesting is, is, is I wouldn't have done that. I would have fucked this all up if I were running a hedge fund and running other people's money, because I would have felt like it was my job to be paying attention. And as soon as the stock doubled from two to four, I would have sold half my position. And then it would have doubled to eight. And I would have sold another half my position, but because I'm, uh, um, but because I'm doing this part time and I'm running my business and I'm not paying attention to my personal portfolio, you know, I just bought a bought a fifty thousand dollar chunk of it, which wasn't enough to worry me if it went to zero. But you know, it goes up six x and that moves the needle, right? Um, and in between, I did nothing. We learned the uh, you know Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger principles of <laughs> patience, sit, right? Sit on your ass investing. Exactly. And just wait until things are really obvious. So I bought when things were really obviously uh, oversold. And who knows whether I'm selling at the top? I don't really care. The, the only reason I didn't sell 100% is because um, I call it schmuck insurance. Uh, you know, which is I don't want to feel like the world's biggest asshole if the stock goes from 12 to 20. <laughs> you know, from here, because it very well could. Carl sure. Icahn bought a, became the largest shareholder of this company at $17 two years ago. He turned down an offer to sell the company at $13. It then went to 85 cents. I bought it on the rebound a month after the market bottomed a year ago in April, end of April, the market bottomed at the end of March. 
Um, and the stock had already gone up to two bucks. Um, but, um, uh, um, and today, I don't know, it peaked at 14 or something last week. And, and, and then, um, and now it's at 12 or something like that. So, uh, you know, I'm just holding on to a little position. I certainly wouldn't, it's sort of, it's sort of illogical, I realize, to say, well, I, I sure as hell am not a buyer today. I'm really a seller. So, well, then why am I holding on to $50,000 worth of it? You know, 20% of my position. And the answer is purely emotional. Don't want to feel like a schmuck if it goes up a bunch. Asaf uh, wanted to ask if you, feel, you see any other correlation between the real estate and the stock market now. I mean, I think they're both um, they're both on fire, um, uh, in part due to super low interest rates and generally strong recovering economy, a lot of money in people's pockets uh, right now. Um, and look, if I think about what could unwind the stock market, um, I think the single biggest risk factor is is that a new um, COVID variant emerges because we fuck ups can't get everybody, even though we have enough to immunize everybody. Well, we're not, we're not immunizing everybody in Africa or something. Some variant emerges that the vaccines don't work against and the world starts to, the world shuts down again. Um, uh, and, and you know, the way these viruses work and the number of variants that have already emerged, we're just damn lucky the you know the delta variant while twice as contagious um is the 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 vaccine seem to still work very well against it so you know we've been lucky um so you know if the world shuts down again um uh, you know the stock market and the real estate market are taking a bath and the problem with the real estate market is there's just a lot of built-in leverage in the stock market right now companies balance sheets are very healthy generally um uh, you got a lot of companies sitting on a lot of cash. Uh, I'm not sure that's true in the real estate world, though I will say relative to 2008, um, the, the banking, financial, and real estate systems are in the U.S. anyway, I, I can't speak to Europe or Israel, um, are much, much, much healthier. Um, uh, the banks today are levered 12 to 1. Lehman was levered 35 to 1 when it went under. Um, but it wasn't just the leverage, which has co come down a lot, um, but the amount of fraud. Um, you know, there's just, there was, what, what blew the world apart in 08 wasn't just leverage, and it certainly wasn't just declining in housing prices. It was the decline in housing prices combined with extreme leverage, but, but what really freaked the debt investors of the world out was the fraud, because nobody had any confidence in the underlying assets uh, you know, uh, underlying all these toxic CDOs and so forth. So um, I can tell you, I just applied for a million dollar home equity line of credit on this apartment, which is worth $3 million and I have no mortgage on it. You would think that would sail through, right? A million dollar HELOC on a $3 million apartment uh, on the Upper East Side of New York, right? It's not, and it's not like it's there, we're in some bubble here or anything like that, right? And, you know, it's not like I have no other debts, you know, whatever. They, it was a root canal. They gave me a root canal to give me the fricking million dollar HELOC. Um, uh, and so if I'm getting a root canal for this kind of loan, it tells me that there can't be a lot of fraud going on out there. Satyan can share her experience with you. Hey. <laughs> yeah. I'm on the Upper East Side as well. Okay. <laughs> we, 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 go, we go through it every, every, uh, every, every uh, application for uh, yeah. more. Actually, more B, of a, B of A would not give me the HELOC. I had to go to First Republic. Um, a friend told me that they're more accustomed because I'm an entrepreneur and 100% of my income comes through a K-1. Um, and I was, this was a year, year and a half ago, a year ago anyway. So I was only a year, year and a half into a new business. Um, so my income profile was super weird. My balance sheet was great. The asset was great, but my income statement was weird. And B of A turned me down. So, you know, First, First Republic, um, you know, eventually did, did the loan, but, um, you know, it, it was, uh, it was, a, it was an, an ordeal. Yeah. We still feel it. We still feel it with the uh, with the banks right now. It's, the, it's still yeah. an experience right now with the banks. So, uh, but I think just for the, for the common investor, that's a good thing, right? I mean, it's just not getting it's not a fraud, as like you said, is taking weeded yeah. out of the system after what we went through in two thousand eight. I think just for the general yeah. 
general person in the middle of America, you know, it's, if they have to scrutinize their assets to get a loan, I, I think that's a good yeah. thing in the whole thing. You bet. You bet. And look, housing prices are hitting all time highs, but relative to rental income, relative to the balance sheets of the people underlying, I mean, just forget the fraud. Um, you know, how's, uh, I mean, housing prices could go down for sure, but you're not going to see a 30% plunge because there was just nothing but air beneath it back in 08. Um, you know, the fundamentals are actually very strong. Uh, th th thank you, Whitney. Uh, I know that you have to run in a few minutes. Yeah. So yeah. I want to, I want to thank you. I want to say one more thing because we discussed the uh, uh, COVID variant. I want to thank uh, Whitney. Whitney was very, during the pandemic, uh, Whitney was very active, uh, volunteering and, 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 and assisting people with vac vaccination uh, uh, information, all of this. I get the emails and I get the notices. So thank you very much for- Yeah, your... you, you came, uh, Tal joined me. Um, there was a COVID hospital across the street from my apartment. Um, you may, re those of you on the Upper East Side may recall, we had a, a tent hospital in Central Park. Um, and that I was very active volunteering with and tall. Uh, I recruited all my friends to come over and pitch in and help set up tents and beds and so forth. And tall, tall was always right there. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. And again, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time right now. Uh, it was very knowledgeable, very uh, uh, helpful. Uh, and we appreciate you taking the time. And, uh, All right, my pleasure. Um, thank you. And I'll send you to all a PDF if you don't already have it in my book. Feel free to circulate it to the group. And anyone who has any questions or whatever, um, email me. And if anyone wants to get my free, uh, I send out a daily investing email with sort of my thoughts on the market, et cetera, that goes out to 137,000 people every weekday. Um, so, um, if you want to join that, just go to empirefinancialresearch.com and there's a little box. You can just type in your email, um, ignore all the marketing emails that you'll get. That's just part of the business model. And just focus on the, uh, uh, just focus on my daily, uh, my daily, uh, which I think, uh, I've been doing it for 20 years and, uh, I'd like to think, uh, there's some good stuff in there. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care, Thank everybody. You very much. Very much. Right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day, guys. I'm going to send everybody an email, whoever is still here. We're going to send you all the emails with the link to the, to the recording and, of course, uh, link to uh, Whitney's uh, website so you can register if you like to hear him. He's an extremely nice guy and very knowledgeable. Have a good day, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.